just tell me briefly, uh, what, what, what do you do? What is your profession? Well, I, I'm a writer, and um, what I've done recently is put out a book called The History of Rock and Roll, Volume 1, which tells the story of the music that became rock and roll from 1920 to the end of 1963. So you've got a, uh, sounds like a pretty good history in... in well, I've always been interested in, in the history of music um, and, and how it developed, and certainly I could have pushed the start of the book back much further to minstrel shows and early musicals and so forth, but that's been done a lot. I wanted to focus on the words rock and roll, which, of course, Texas dance halls aren't, but... They're not, but somehow you got hooked up with this dance hall tour. Yeah. Well, I am interested, well, there's two things about it that interest me. Number one, when I'm in a place, I always want to know where I am, what this place is, what it means. And the other thing is that the mainstream of American popular music has always been fed and nourished by non-mainstream tributaries. And certainly, the music played in Texas dance halls um, contributed to that a great deal. Um, not only the um, country and western music that was played there, but also the brass bands and polka bands, the use of horns. You know, you wind up with people who can play horns and maybe they're not gonna wanna play polka. Maybe they wanna go to San Antonio and, and uh, get in the uh, rhythm and blues scene in San Antonio or they want to be a rhythm and blues band based in rural Texas and, and tour all the local dance halls for the teenagers. There's all kinds of ways that things that seem, you know, square or old fashioned fit in. What did, when, when you went out to these halls, uh, what did you take away? What did, did you learn from them? Well, I, I learned a lot about social organization in these ethnic communities, the Czech, um, Moravian, Bohemian, and uh, German communities, and, and whether they were uh, organized around the church or whether they were organized, as the Germans did, around Verein, which uh, is a, one of those German words with about 30 different meanings. Um, it can mean uh, team, as in a soccer team or it can mean organization, as in an organization of doctors or something. But it can also just mean a club. And so you have um, Turnverein, which uh, does German gymnastics. Um, you have, um, you have Zangverein, like, this, the Zanger in the Hall here, um, which is singing societies. People just get together for a certain, um, a certain reason and uh, do it. That's a, that's a big deal in German society, uh, coalescing around an interest, uh, especially an interest that's physical or performance oriented. So you have, you know, Vereins that write and perform poetry in a bar where they'll gather, or these people put on uh, gymnastic exhibitions, the Turners. Uh, there, we went to a dance hall that was uh, run by a Schussverein, which um, was old-fashioned German target shooting. Um, in Germany, the only way these days you can legally own a weapon uh, is that you join a Schussverein and um, you can, you have to take a certain number of lessons and get a certificate from them before you can take your rifle home, no handguns at all. You can take your rifle home and then, since you are certified, you can then go out hunting uh, once you get your hunting license and, um, and come home with a tasty wild boar or maybe a hunk of venison. No uh, regular. Uh Regulated militia required, I guess. No. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, the, the shoots and grinds. That's um, is that uh, you know because uh, we've seen that in the German halls around here, but also some of the maybe some of the Czech halls. Do you think that the Czechs have have these varieties as much as the German? No, the the Czechs tend to organize it around the church, I mean, and the Catholic Church offers a great number of social opportunities um, around its its program, and you know there there. Are, groups that are dedicated to a given saint or that are dedicated towards a, um, a holiday, you know, the, the ladies who prepare the Easter dinner or something. Um, so, because the, the, they're Catholic, not, not Protestant. Um, the Protestants don't have the saints and um, they don't have the, uh, they do have the, uh, the holidays, any excuse to drink beer, you know, that's a, I think it's in the German constitution, but I could never find the exact article. Um, it's just, um, it, the recreation is ultimately for the same purpose, but it's just expressed differently in the two religious traditions. Uh, when we went out uh, east, it seemed like there were more Czech uh, settlements than when we did the hill country tour, more German. Yeah, that's where they settled. Did you have a particular preference on, on which side dance halls fall or the cultures? The, I was more interested in, in the social phenomenon of the dance halls and the fact that people who were living in pretty unsophisticated surroundings, like little villages, which is basically all most of those towns were, um, that, they, that they would actually build a structure to have these social events in. And the structures then helped the organizations continue. You know, it would be ridiculous to dissolve the saints society when you've got a place where every year the entire community gathers to, on the saints day for a celebration. Why do that? You know, and, and you know, it's not only do we have a post office and a church and a general store, we also have this dance hall. You know, so we're a community. It's, you know, the, the post office may have somebody from outside behind the window, and who knows who runs the general store, but this thing is by and for and of the community, which is important. Do you think that 120, 140 years ago when they were building uh, these communities that they realized these halls would be around so long and have uh, been, become such a part of Texas culture? I don't think they were thinking in those terms. I think they were hoping they could make it day to day. Um, this was an unknown territory. There were scary tales of Indians. Um, and these were people who didn't speak English as a first language at least, and who were in a state that was very much under the control of an English-speaking majority in the capital city. And they made the laws. These people were just happy to be able to make a living and do things like they did in the old country, you know, farm, produce food, brew beer, those kind of things. We were talking earlier about the if they still speak some of the language of the Czech or the German, have you have you run across uh, in your travels these communities um, people that are still fluent in the language? Not recently. I do remember interviewing a guy named Johnny Hibner, who was the brewmaster at uh, Spitzel Brewery in, in uh, Shiner, and he did speak Czech with some of his older workers. He was, a, he was a younger guy than most of them. I'd say he was in his late 40s, early 50s when I talked to him. Um, and he was very, very fluent, you know. He, he would turn away from our interview and go, hey, Jan, da, 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 and, and say something in, in Czech to the guy. And the guy would go, okay, Johnny. <laughs> but um, no, mostly, mostly uh, the latest article I read on uh, German in uh, Texas is that uh, it, it's almost impossible to find anybody under 
50 who speaks the idiomatic uh, Texas German. By that I mean that like any language that split off from its source early on, the um, German spoken in Texas is a little bit different than um, the German spoken in Germany. Uh, the, the best example of that is that in, um, in Germany, uh, when you say to drive your car, you say fahren. Um, but that word was also the word you used to drive a wagon into town. And that's how the Germans who settled in Texas uh, used it. And today, or today, when Deutschtext became, you know, a thing, and the car was introduced into society, they they knew the um, the English word for it, and so they wouldn't say "Ich fahre mein Auto." They say "Ich treibe mein Auto." They just took the word "drive" and turned it into German. But there are other examples. That's that's the only one that comes strictly to mind. But um, certainly. Uh, there, were, there, were, there were things that they brought from the old country, words that they brought from the old country that are no longer used there as well as, yeah, you find this, you know, Cajun French is a form of provincial French um, which dates back to the 1600s because that was when the French settlers in Canada who were the ancestors of the Cajuns in Louisiana um, arrived. Uh, Latin American Spanish arrived with the Spanish colonials also in the 1600s. And it's different from the Spanish spoken in Spain today. Now, what, uh, how long did you spend in Germany? I spent 15 years in, in Berlin. And was it just pleasure, business? It, well, I was marooned there. It's a long story. Okay. But I, I eventually wound up uh, doing how would I put it, um, freelance cultural coverage for the Wall Street Journal Europe. Uh, every two weeks I would have to do an article. So I got to see a lot of that, uh, the part of Europe that was my beat. Scandinavia, Germany, Switzerland, and Eastern Europe, Austria, some of that. Never officially went to France or uh, the Netherlands, Belgium, like that. But I, I got, I, you know, I really, I did get into uh, where I was and, and I also got to do a lot of sort of investigating because when I was there it was a very interesting time when the East was still integrating with the West and so there were still, to a large extent, two cultures under one government in Germany. And once again, I, there were parts of the old culture that were very worthwhile that the West Germans were trying to eliminate and the, uh, the East Germans didn't appreciate that. So I got to witness some of that conflict. But also these places, I, 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 Silesia, uh, one of those dancing couples up there on the wall, um, a very distinct kind of German culture because it's quite remote um, it's north of some swamps that have people who live in the swamps who speak a whole different language. Um, I think some of them came to the United States too. They're called either Wends or Sorbs. Yeah. Dep you know, and they speak Wendish or Sorbish depending on who you ask. And they have this culture where they have these flat bottom boats out in the swamps and they, they raise cucumbers and make pickles that are legendary. They're quite good. I've had them. But I went to uh, Silesia. I had this idea for a, a travel company where we would bring Americans uh, to Germany and um, do food tours where not fancy food but you know stuff you wouldn't see ordinarily and a friend of mine who's very very much a fan of Silesia suggested that I go try a dish called um, Schlesische Himmel und Erde, which means Silesian heaven and earth. And it was um, pork and dried fruit and potatoes stewed together. And it's the dish of that particular corner of Germany. 
and we decided that yeah that was something we would add to our uh, to our tour of course the other half of our idea was to bring germans to the united states and tour them around the south and you know feed them barbecue and stuff like that soul food and expose them to some of the music down here Sounds like that could have been an adventure. yeah it would have been a great thing to do but the uh guy who was going to be my partner and who had just inherited a good part of a 15 million dollar fortune um, decided he was going on a bike tour and the first day out his bike was hit by a SUV and he was killed instantly. So there goes that. But they, you know, it's interesting. See the thing about Texas that I think th this whole dance hall thing is, is a, a symptom of is that it is culturally conservative which is not to be confused with um, politically conservative. It means that trends don't tend to happen here because when a culture is confronted with the possibility of change, it resists and evaluates. It says, do we really need to do this? Or is there a gentler way to do it? And this means that when something is established, like the music, the polka, um, the polka scene in, in East Texas, um, the, uh, the umpa bands, the Zangverein um, in the German part of Texas, that they last a lot longer than they would if they'd sprung up in New York. I mean, you know, there were Germans in New York, in New York City. There, there were, um, there a, was a big German community, um, but of course they uh, went with Hitler uh, in the days before the Second World War. A lot of them did, not all of them certainly. Um, and um, so that, that kind of didn't do them any good. But, you know, the, New York's oldest restaurant is Luchow's which is a German beer hall. I'm not sure it's still open, but for years it was advertised as the oldest restaurant in New York. And um, when I worked in 1967 um, at the Metropolitan Museum, my uh, subway stop was 86th Street. And if I turned left, I'd go to the museum. If I turned right, there was this whole area of German shops. There was a, a grocery store. Um, there were shops selling trachten, which are traditional costumes. Um, don't see that so much, well, they can't afford to be in Manhattan anymore. But, you know, the, the ethnic enclaves, uh, the, the Dutch, where I grew up, um, are, they vanished, and, and all traces of Dutch culture, and those were the people who settled New York. Um, and, and they've utterly vanished. You don't see that much, if you do see ethnic culture it tends to be from later immigrants um, a friend of mine in jersey city get, gets to see a guatemalan independence day celebration every year in the park across from her house um, i went to jersey city and um, landed smack in the middle of navratri which was a hindu festival i knew nothing about but i was staying in an Indian run hotel in Little India in Jersey City. And by God, I got to hear religious music right up until 3 a.m. when the cops made them shut it down. Um, but those people are really recent immigrants as opposed to the people who settled the place. Here, the people who settled the place are still perpetuating these old cultural mores and, and, and cultural artifacts, um, not as much as before. The mass media has been really, really working on the younger generation. Um, but, you know, because I've, I've always said country music died the day when you walk out into the field and take off the headphones of the kid driving the tractor and you hear Metallica. You know, you wouldn't hear George Strait because that was old fashioned. If you can convince the kids that it's too old-fashioned to be cool, you kill the culture. But you don't necessarily, that doesn't necessarily happen. It tends to happen in places where there is 
I don't want to say poverty, but there's less money at any rate. Um, Cajun culture almost died out uh, in the 19, late 1950s, early 1960s, but it became a point of pride to play that music, speak French, uh, and then it did a turnaround so that now there are people in their 20s who are not only playing Cajun music, but sort of reinventing it. They're writing new songs, they're using the old forms to pl play new pieces of music, and um, I don't think that's gonna happen with polka and brass bands in Central Texas, but that's because the kids have been, you know, convinced that it's not a good thing. I don't think the, a lot of these Cajun kids got MTV. I'm pretty sure they didn't even get cable because why bother? There's not enough money down there to make it worthwhile, you know, throwing cable down there. They've got it now, but I think it's too late to prevent the resurgence of the culture. Uh, I'm not nearly as optimistic about Texas, but it is culturally conservative and so it did last a lot longer than it normally would have. I, I always tell the story of when I was working at the newspaper here in Austin in the 1980s and I went to see Bobby Blue Bland, who was a blues singer um, and whose heyday had been, oh, probably 20 years before I saw him, but he packed the hall, not with fabulous Thunderbirds fans, but with actual black people, working class black people I had a family sitting next to me with three teenage daughters, and the minute Bobby Bland walked out on stage, they went crazy, screaming, Bobby, ah! You know, which, that's perfectly good teenage behavior, but not for a guy who's like 30, 40 years older than you are, singing a kind of music that if he got on a plane and went to Kansas City to perform, he would get white jazz fans and hipsters. But down here, he was connecting with his people. With the culture. Yeah, with the culture, which hadn't died out. And still, the South generally, and I think um, at least some of urban Texas, still responds to that kind of music because of the cultural conservatism. Yeah, I can see it with some of the halls, like the, the Schutz and Brags, you know, with, with them staying, you know, still being like a, all, you know, male clubs, male halls. Yeah, because it always has been like that. Yeah. It's very slow to, to change those. I also don't think very many women living in even a mildly traditional German American culture would be much interested in shooting. But I mean, it's, it's not about hunting or self defense, it is about you know, target shooting. So I, I, I find it interesting that some women haven't interested themselves in it. They do everything else in rural Texas, you know, farming and you know, raising crops and, and livestock and taking them to market and so forth. There's no reason why they shouldn't take those long, old fashioned long rifles and uh, shoot at the target. Maybe they just think it's a guy thing. Yeah, maybe they got things they do with needle and thread that uh, also hark back to that culture. I really don't know. You know, there, there could be, they could make trachten for special occasions or they might have something like the traditional Cajun culture. Um, when a girl is 12 years old, she starts to make a quilt. Um, and she learns how to make the quilt from her grandmother and her mother, who teach her quilting techniques. And when she finishes it, she puts it in a chest for her granddaughter. And that's how that particular tradition is continued in traditional Cajun culture, which still does exist. Like this hall here and, and the other dance halls that, that, that you've seen, um, 
are they influenced, their, their architecture is in, influenced anyway from what you've seen over there? Do they have dance halls, community centers over there? Like they no, uh, well, I didn't see many. I didn't get out into rural Germany very much, and I definitely didn't spend much time in southern Germany. Um, and, and a lot of these uh, states that are on the wall here are either southwestern or um, southern Germany. I mean, Bavaria was Catholic, and so a lot of the people who settled here were Bavarian. Braunfels is in Bavaria, and New Braunfels is in Texas. Um, also, Hesse, which is um, in the middle of Germany. I actually, uh, I have a friend whose name is Schulenberg, and uh, he came over here for South by Southwest one time, and we uh, went to Schulenberg, Texas, because, of course, he had to see it. And uh, he uh, got the town historian on the telephone who told him where the, the founder of the town, his name was Schulenberg, was buried. And we went back there, and uh, Fred had his notebook out. And uh, we found the guy's tombstone immediately. And it said, Geboren in Hessen. And he goes, oh good, that's us. And um, so he says, now grandma has something else to occupy the next couple of years of her life. And um, then we went back to the Tourist Information Center and bought 24 coffee mugs that say Schulenberg, halfway to everywhere. <laughs> and uh, then we went to Louisiana. But, uh, you know, I, I don't know about, as you say, what they would tend to be would, in my opinion, they, they would be halls that would be attached. I'm trying to think. Because, see, I, I was in Berlin, and Berlin basically didn't exist before about 1820. So any, I mean, there, there were theaters and, and venues and, and dance halls, but they were integrated into larger structures. I, I know there was a, um, a dance hall that the Jewish community used that was part of the um, Handwerker Verein. There's the use of the word Verein as meaning uh, trade union. And so this was the uh, hand workers or you know, manual laborers union. Um, and where else? Oh, there were Baal houses. That was, those were largely in East Berlin, but they were commercial enterprises where touring orchestras would play and they were, you know, they had a bar and they sometimes served food and it wasn't quite the same as a community uh, building the way the ones here are. I don't, uh, and as far as the architecture, I really can't speak to that. So much traditional German architecture has been destroyed or um, has fallen apart over the years that I really couldn't speak to that. I, I would say that uh, largely the, um, the phenomenon that we see in Texas is a 19th century uh, phenomenon and that uh, in earlier years in Germany you wouldn't see things like this happening. It was as German society was sort of integrating and, and figuring out what it was that the people who didn't, you know, fit in the lines um, had to define themselves through things like these dance halls and so forth. And like I said, they immigrated to the United States where religious nonconformity would, uh, would be easily tolerated because you'd be in your own community with others like you. And that's what these things were selling, cohesion of community, which is something that virtually doesn't exist anymore in the United States. Do you think these halls and these communities will continue to survive and flourish in the current state? Not unless a compelling reason uh, continues. In other words, if there are enough, say, touring country artists to um, continue to play them. I know a lot of the, you know, lower level and on their way up or on the way down uh, artists do play these halls fairly frequently. 
you know, if there's enough of that kind of business to make it worthwhile for somebody to invest in keeping a dance hall up, yeah. If some way to monetize it as a tourist attraction can be found, yeah. Um, but it won't necessarily be part of a community um, effort or part of a, a community organization. It will be a, as a commercial thing. Um, and as I say, the, the things like language and religion that bound these communities together are very much disappearing. Um, evangelical fundamentalist Christianity has really taken over a lot from the traditional um, German free thinker and uh, the Bohemian Catholic uh, traditions so that they don't have the same kind of you know traditions that those churches had so a lot of that is going to disappear has disappeared if, if like in, in Louisiana if you can keep the young people interested well the young people grow up and then they have young people of their own and that way you keep a tradition going but I don't see that happening here how did you find out about the uh, dance hall tour with Steve? I think Steve mentioned it on Facebook and I had just moved here and I thought wow that would be a great way to get out and see the countryside and he was going to places I'd never been to before and I'm also I'm, I'm really interested in history I mean I, I just at the end of um, uh, March and the beginning of May I went over to Europe for two weeks and what I did um, after I spent a couple days in Barcelona because I love the city and then I um, I went to France and started trying to figure out the Catalonian influence on the southern and western part of France on the Mediterranean because that is you want to say Spanish but the Catalonians are trying very hard to become independent in Spain but there was a, a part of France that was run by Catalonia. And I always, I go to museums, and I go to old buildings, and I go to churches. And these are places where I can learn things about the history of the place. I also have a great interest in the food and, and other traditional things. I one day was driving to a castle on top of a mountain and went through a small town and there were a bunch of people gathered at a guy's house and they were all in some kind of traditional uh, outfit and some of them had musical instruments in their hands and I figured that later in the day, it was a Sunday, there was going to be some kind of festival at a church um, and that's what they were dressed up for. Uh, I, it really interests me. I don't just go to some place to be there. I want to know where I am and what it is and what it was. And that's my primary motivation in going to places. The idea of spending two weeks on the beach is a vision of hell for me. Because unless, you know, there's a Greek shipwreck or something. <laughs> on, a, on our adventure, did you have a particular hall that stuck out to you that was a favorite or a community that was a favorite? Well, we did this twice. Um, I did admire, I can't remember where it was, there was an octagonal dance hall that was used a lot by the Mexican-American community for, I don't know the word, quinceañera, the uh, 15th uh, birthday of a girl. Um, and so they were doing pretty well because there's lots of Mexican girls turning 15 and they know there's a place that can have this celebration that's in their community, they take it because it's probably a whole lot cheaper than going out of town and renting a hall, you know, in, in LaGrange or something. I don't know, if, if somewhere down the line a bunch of crazy Mexican teenagers want to do a German poker revival band and and start it turns out to be a hip thing to do in that part of the country then you know that's wonderful 
they, they haven't so much repurposed it as they've um, appropriated a dying tradition from another culture. You know, much as white blues bands picked up Chicago blues and gave the older guys who were still playing Chicago blues um, a brand new audience and a brand new way to make money. That was a great thing. You know, in the footsteps of the Rolling Stones, Muddy Waters start, started getting money gigs again. Can't say no to that. No, man, it was a good second life there. Yeah. Um, so what do, you, what do you think Steve Dean has brought to these uh, dance halls? I think publicity. He's a, a fanatic. He's completely obsessed. I mean, I, I have no idea how he got this particular bee in his bonnet, but he did, and, and that's a good thing. He's, he's fighting real hard for the preservation of these places. He's deeply interested in the history. Um, he's you know, putting out these books. I don't know if he's ever put out more than just the one, but um, he wants to know why these things happened and, and when they were made and, and why they disappeared. Um, that's of great interest to him. He's, he's also real interested in, in seeing them survive. And if that means he has to take a gig running one of them for a while, he'll do it. You know, and, and he'll quit in disgust usually, but um, <laughs> who can blame him? How long have you known him? Uh, I knew Steve back when he and his mom were running the Austex Lounge when I moved here in 79 to work at the newspaper. But we didn't, you know, we weren't big buddies or anything. I really didn't like the Austex much. Mm -hmm. It was kind of where the fourth level blues bands played. But I was never a Stevie Ray Vaughan fan either, so. <laughs> Same here. So he's, he, you covered the Austex. Uh, what else is it? What, what else have you followed him in? Well, that was all I knew him from when I was here. I, I was, there was nothing happening at the Austex that I needed to cover, so I, I wasn't there very often. Um, and um, a lot of the people he was aligned with were people who were, you know, sort of marginal to most of the stuff I was writing about. I also had to be careful that I didn't run into trouble with my employers, which is a whole other story. The interests that the statesman has, but had, I can't speak for the current administration, but back then there were interests that I was not allowed to write about. And I was ordered to give every show at the Irwin Center a good review and not mention the sound. It sounds like horrible than every, every show I've ever been to. The, the sound there is perfectly good. You just didn't hear it right. Or I don't know what the excuse was. <laughs> but there were these two mafia goombas and the publisher at this meeting, and they laid down the law. The goombas told me what I could, could and couldn't write. Huh. Well, at least you still got a paycheck. Yeah, I got a paycheck, and I, th nothing happened at the Irwin Center so often that I was living there so much as I was, you know, at more worthwhile clubs where, you know, the Continental Club, Liberty Lunch, um, um, Club Foot, Antones. These were the places I was reporting on. Cause it, and it was much more interesting, you know, arena rock is arena rock. And it, it, it's really disconnected from anything except the pop music machinery. And, uh, you know, that, that's of course part of what fuels my interest in, in dance halls, is that that's not part of, it hasn't been part of the pop music machinery for decades. And yet, it seems to still be functioning. It probably needs a bit of life support, but there's still something happening there.